Hi, I'm Mark Tyrrell of Uncommon Knowledge and welcome to How to Help Your Client Overcome Their Limiting Beliefs, Three Cognitive Therapy Techniques to Help Rapidly Reframe Unhelpful Ideas. They'll all hate me. You must think I'm an idiot. I know exactly what's going to happen. I'm just going to make a fool of myself again. As a therapy practitioner, I know you've heard negative limiting beliefs like this again and again. And boy, do they ever cause problems. They lurk unexamined like scary sea creatures skulking beneath the waves of consciousness. It can only be seen for what they are once they're raised from the murk and viewed in a wider context. So how do you start bringing damaging assumptions into the light of day without it being overwhelming? Cognitive reframing is an art as well as a science. A reframe done artfully can certainly help people think differently, more widely and more creatively. But a cognitive reframe should be able to appeal to emotion as well as logic. That's why learning to deliver reframes in a way that makes them intensely compelling is so important. When writing my book on reframing and creating the course Conversational Reframing, it became clear that the delivery and clothing of the reframe is vital. For a reframe to take, it needs to be delivered during a time in which the client's attention is locked on what you're saying so that they're more open to new and healthier perspectives. So what kind of cognitive distortions might we need to reframe in order to help our clients lead happier, more fulfilling lives? Here's a quick rundown of some of the types of assumptions that operate below the choppy waves of life. You've probably heard more than a few of these. So first we have fatalism. Nothing ever works out for me. I guess I just wasn't meant to be happy. People like me never get a lucky break. I think I've attracted this bad luck. It's karma for the way I treated my first wife or husband. I've somehow brought this on, this disease on myself. Mind reading. She must really hate me now. They all think I'm stupid. He'd rather go out with her than me. Genetics. My mother was a depressive. I must have got it from her. Medicalizing. This anxiety or depression is a medical disease just like type 1 diabetes. Once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. No one ever really recovers. Infallible prediction. I know exactly what's going to happen. They're all going to hate me. Okay. Judging others by one's own standards. It's just not right. People just shouldn't behave like that. I would never do that, so how can they behave like that? Cause and effect. She broke up with me because I'm not like her first boyfriend. Comparison to others. My friend gets so much more attention from the opposite sex than I do. I'll never be as attractive as them. Intentionality. He's trying to make me feel guilty for not having done enough overtime at work. That's what he's trying to do. Personality profiling. I could never get a job like that in marketing because I'm an introvert. Globalizing from the particular to the general. My marriage fell apart. I screw up everything in my life. Internalizing the negative. My boss was in such a weird mood today. I must have done something awful to upset her. Stabilizing the negative. I'll never meet anyone else I like as much as that person. I've never had any success and I never will. And there are plenty more where those came from, but those are a few of the kinds of assumptions that limit people's lives and often remain untroubled by any conscious or direct challenge. Oh, and you may have noticed something about all of those interpretations. The problem of negative certainty. That's right, they're all extreme. Black or white, all or nothing, she hates me, not she might not like what I did there. Life is seen in emotionally extreme terms. Now, don't get me wrong, these subjective interpretations of situations may or may not 
reconcile with the way things are for a particular person. But one thing's for sure, we and our clients can't assume that they represent reality. And even if they represent some parts of reality, they probably never represent as much as the cognitive distortion would have the client believe. Being too sure that your own take on something, especially a highly emotive issue, is right can lead you down so many wrong paths and is something to overcome. There is nearly always another more moderate and subtle way of seeing. We know that when people depress, get angry or feel any strong emotion, reality becomes biased for them. They become less objective. So part of treatment can be a gentle, and I don't even want to say challenging, exploration of someone's assumptions. Now, how best to do that? Here are three ways to sow a little helpful uncertainty in a client's limiting beliefs. So first off, we can cast doubt with a subjective frame. Of course, you need to respect what your client believes because clashing too crassly with someone's belief system can break rapport in the blink of an eye, regardless of how positive you're trying to be. But you can specifically and overtly frame their statement of fact as an opinion or idea when you feed back what they've said to you. This is a gentle first step to deeper reframing later in the therapy. So, uh, for, for example, the client might say, nothing is good in my life. Absolutely nothing. And you might say, it's really horrible to feel that nothing's good in your life, isn't it? So you're not explicitly saying, ah, that's just your take on things, it's your subjective interpretation, as that can so easily be rejected. Rather, you're communicating sympathetically in a way that carries a subtle reframe. Number two, have them modify their position. So to help people properly, you sometimes need to get specific. So someone might say, um, my whole life is a mess. And that, of course, is a generalization. If someone tells you they can't do anything right, you could ask them if they know how to tie their shoelaces or how on earth they managed to find your clinic, or whether they know how to switch on their TV. I'm not suggesting you use exactly those examples, although knowing me, I probably would. But the point is that we're breaking down the all or nothing, the globalizing by getting specific. It's easy to get sucked into the emotional extremism of someone with emotional difficulties. Someone with emotional problems is an emotional extremist as, as regards those problems. When your client moves away from emotional extremism and becomes more moderate in their responses to life and therefore in their cognitive interpretations, then therapeutic progress can be really rapid. So an example of that would be, you might say to them, I think you mentioned you have a lovely daughter. And the client might say, might say to you, yes, I do. She's the sweetest thing. And then you might say, and you mentioned you feel there's nothing good in your life. So is it fair to say that there's at least one good thing in your life because you mentioned your lovely daughter? And the client then has to sort of modify their position a bit. Okay, well, I didn't quite mean that, you know. And then you might say, okay, so what I'm interested in here is getting a bit more specific with what you want to be better in your life. Because depression has a way of conning people into thinking in absolute terms. And we've just seen that in action, haven't we? Three, where is the evidence? Strong emotion makes us second guess the future or makes us feel convinced we know 100% for sure the way things are. Learning to relax with uncertainty can directly improve the mental well-being of your client. Being able to sit pretty with not knowing whether we've upset someone or whether our date will like us or how the first day at work is going to go is a great skill. Refusing to jump to negative conclusions or be sucked into believing one's own scary imagination helps clients break through much of the overthinking and feeling that accompanies so much emotional distress. Knowing how to hold a meaning vacuum until real evidence comes along is something you can teach your clients. The calmer we can be, the more able we are to not prematurely speculate. So knowing how to relax your clients so that they can see reality more in the round with less bias is a vital therapeutic skill. Telling your client that you're struggling with what they have told you because you're not sure the evidence is strong enough is a neat way of helping them question their own negative certainties without directly clashing with them. So for example, your client might say, um, oh, she really hates me. And you might say, has she told you that she hates you in so many words? And the client might say, well, no. And then you might say, well, did she tell someone else 
that she hates you and, th and they've told you this. And again, the client might say, well, no, that didn't happen either. And then you might say, so what is your evidence that she really hates you? Is she the kind of woman who's full of hate? Is she a hater? Okay. And the client might say, well, no, actually, she's quite a kind person. Then you might say, well, I'm interested to know how you know she hates you or how you think you know that she hates you. And the client might say, well, she must do after what happened. And you might say, well, it's certainly possible she might, but the evidence so far doesn't look so good. And the client might say, what do you mean? And you might say, well, we have to live by feedback and evidence, don't we? And I think at least some of the time, and from what you've said about what she's like as a person, the lack of concrete evidence that she hates you, and some evidence you mentioned earlier that she's still like to make a go of it with you, I'm struggling to understand why you feel she must hate you. Maybe there's some evidence I don't know about. Am I missing something here? Fill me in. So notice there's no arguing or telling the client they're wrong, just an encouragement of more objective thinking. You can ask people simple questions like, just as a thought experiment, what would be another way of looking at that? I think it's vitally important to understand that people don't often hold these beliefs consciously. You may often hear people say things like, yes, I know logically I'm not really stupider than other people, but I just feel as if I am. And this way of talking is one of the telltale signs of hidden assumptions lurking below the surface of the mind, secretly driving the way people view the world and sometimes blocking real hope from growing and flowering within them. It's only when we dredge up those dark shapes from beneath the choppy waves of feeling that we come to see that what seem to be all-powerful monsters are in fact bits of old weed that can be discarded. Now we can see them for what they really are and can enjoy casting our eyes across the vastness of the open sea and land. So I hope you found that useful and if you did please hit like and subscribe and if you want to hear when my next video is published hit the notification bell below. I'm Mark Tyrrell of Uncommon Knowledge and if you'd like to subscribe to my email newsletter you can find it over at unk.com slash blog that's unk.com slash blog and thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.